Thank you for watching this online class presentation from Cedarville University. Did you know 100% of Cedarville freshmen receive generous financial aid? Cedarville is doing everything we can to make our academically excellent, distinctively Christian education more affordable for families. We invite you to learn more at cedarville.edu. Isaiah is all about mission. And mission is one of those ideas that you may not have heard much about, but once you start, once you learn the idea, all of a sudden you find that it's everywhere. Um, for example, I just did a little Google search here, and every company has a mission statement. Uh, sometimes they seem a little, uh, a, a little odd. Uh, Coca-Cola wants to refresh the world to inspire moments of optimism and happiness to create value and make a difference. Now, it's just a you know, it's just a soft drink, right? But they're trying, they're trying to, you know, include that entire atmosphere. And you see it in their ads and all that sort of thing. That's part of how they sell what they do. And I could go down through all of these, but, but probably the, the best way to talk about mission is even to talk about something that's relevant to you. And that is why your degree is accredited at Cedarville. And the reason your degree, degree is accredited here is because we have an, a, a national accrediting body that comes along and says, yes, you fit or yes, you don't. You're, you're qualified to put out an accredited degree or you're not. And the way they do that is they look at our mission statement primarily. Every institution has a mission statement and it basically is a statement of what we're about and what we're going to do. Now, these secular bodies come in and they don't care if we have a Christian statement all they want to know is, do we do what we say we're doing? And so they look at us and say, do you offer an education consistent with biblical truth? Are you really trying to prepare servant leaders with a, with a, a, a background marked by excellence and, and all that sort of thing? And they look through and they say, hmm, you are doing it or you're not. And if you're doing it, then you get accredited, right? It's, it's really kind of one of those things like a truth and advertising sort of thing. Are you really doing what you say you're doing? So with that, I'm going to come back here to the book of Isaiah and talk about their mission statement because Israel has a mission statement that they are measured by. And so if they fulfill their mission statement, they're doing well. If they don't, they are doing poorly. And the book of Isaiah does an awful lot of this measuring by, by what God is expecting of them. So. Let's take a look at the book, and we're going to start with structure uh, and kind of break it down a little bit. There, there are different ways to break it down, but this is not a bad one. And uh, it, what, what you see here are two historical centers. That is, chapters 7 to 12 and 36 to 39 are history. They are stories about events that happened with kings in Israel. The rest of the book are sermons or prophecies or, in some ways, even lectures, all right? So those historical centers, everything kind of revolves around them a bit. And let me give you a little bit more detail. I've given you a couple of different examples of this chart in your notes because I'm going to keep adding things to it. So you might want to kind of start over with a clean, clean chart at various points. There are two historical centers, and they both involve kings of the south. The first king is Ahaz, and the second king is Hezekiah. Obviously, since there's a succession of kings from father to son, Hezekiah is the son of Ahaz. Right? So both Ahaz and Hezekiah respond to similar situations and they have different responses. Uh, both Ahaz and Hezekiah, his son after him, some 20 or 30 years later, face a crisis. And the crisis which both of them face is Assyrian aggression. Now at this point in time, Assyria is like the 500 pound gorilla. Have you guys heard the silly old joke of where does a 500 pound gorilla sit? And the answer is, you know, anywhere he wants to, right? And that's exactly what's going on here. Assyria is the big bad bully of the Middle East at this point in time. And when they get upset or they decide to go on the move and to gobble up little countries around them, there's not much you can do but get worried and get prepared. So Assyrian aggression is the cause of both of these crises. And as it so happens, in both of these stories, in 7 to 12 and 36 to 39, the kings are confronted at the very same place, the Jerusalem water source. I'll talk to you more about that in a little bit. But the basic point is this, that when you're getting ready for a siege from another foreign country, 
um, one of the goals of that siege is just to starve you out. And so you have to make sure your water source is good so that the kings are doing their job here to take a look and make sure their people are safe and have as safe as they can be and have good water to survive, right? So it's a teachable moment. It's like, oh man, we know the bad stuff is coming, so we're kind of open to advice, a very teachable moment. And the issue is who's gonna rescue us? We're in trouble because, man, it's, uh, it, it's, it's tough and we need a rescuer. Right? So both Ahaz and Hezekiah uh, are confronted with that very parallel situation. Now, the trouble is that both of them fail. The, now they fail in different ways. You know, Hezekiah is a good son. He looks at his father and he says, well, I'm not gonna fail like he does, right? So he doesn't, but he fails in his own creative way like we do, right? You look at your parents and think, man, I'm not gonna be like them. I'm gonna be different when I establish my house or whatever. So yeah, you don't make the same mistakes they do, but you make your own that are different. And that's what Hezekiah does here. So <clears throat> what happens is this, there is a solution or lecture afterwards. Now, I don't know what life was like in your family, but in my immediate family, with, with, when I was the dad and had three kids, every, every one of the kids knew that if you messed up and you hit the baseball through the window, that, that the, the worst part of the, of the whole thing was not some punishment you would get, but the lecture you would get from dad, right? Because it's like, oh my goodness, our dad, he's a professor. Every, he thinks everything is a teachable moment. So there was just always this lecture that just came out of me and just overwhelmed them, right? And um, there was a certain point one time where my daughter said, Dad, I know what you're gonna say. And I said, oh, really? You really, you, you know what the lecture is? She said, yeah, Dad, I've heard it so many times. I, I can tell you what you're gonna say. So I said, okay, I'll make you a deal. You, tell, you give me the lecture and then if you do it well, I, I won't do it. Now, I, I knew she wouldn't do that, so I was so prepared. <laughs> Right? But, but then she says, okay, here's what you're going to say. You're going to say that when you did this, you just didn't think, and you weren't thinking about the consequences, and this, and this, and this, and it's like, oh my goodness, I was so amazed. It's like almost, almost tears almost came to my eyes. Like, it was so good. Yes, that was great. That was, that was perfect. Right? And then I realized, wait a minute. If you knew that, how come you did it? I, I, you know, I never got the answer to that question. But, but the point was, in our house, every time you messed up, you, you got this, this big lecture. And that's exactly what's happening here. When Ahaz fails, he gets this big lecture or this solution or this answer to what he did. Same thing happens here then with Hezekiah. When Hezekiah fails, then there is a solution or answer or follow-up from that story. So you can see already with, with five big portions of the book here, we've kind of got four of them nailed down a little bit. And the only thing left here is an introduction and overview in chapters one to six. So it is not simply an overview, it's kind of like a preview of the entire book. So two historical centers the, the, that things revolve around and then solutions or lectures which come after, all right? So let's get back then to, uh, let's get into uh, chapter one <clears throat> and the rebellion of the people stated. So what we're gonna do in this book is we're going to kind of measure Israel, and as you can imagine, at this point in time where we're dealing with the prophets. Prophets only show up when the nation is sick, so it's not gonna be a real positive outcome. So it, we're gonna to try to pull Israel back to God, but um, chances are they're, they're not gonna come. And so this is gonna be an awful lot of condemnation, right? So uh, I want you to see some of the powerful poetry that Isaiah has. Isaiah is a long book, but it's a book that is uh, quoted a lot in the New Testament because of its, its uh, profound statements. And this, this is a good example of one of them. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. So this, this encouragement to forgiveness. And then he says this, if you're willing and obedient, you will eat the best from the land. But notice the irony here. If you resist and rebel, you'll be devoured by the sword. You, you catch the irony that he's getting here? If you obey, you will eat well. If you, don't eat, if you don't obey, you will be eaten, right? So either come and enjoy the meal or be the meal. And ironically, the gospel and the writer of John, so even in the book of Revelation, really mimics a lot of the themes of Isaiah. And you're gonna find this kind of thing even in the book of Revelation, where it says, hey, you can either come to the wedding supper of the Lamb, or you can come to Armageddon, and the birds of the air will eat your flesh at the end. I mean, it's really kind of a gross thing, but the same thing here. 
come and eat well or be eaten, be devoured. Right? So uh, those are the two pretty uh, clear choices. It'd be smart to make the right one. So do the people respond? The answer is no. And so it's illustrated here then in this really profound uh, picture of uh, Israel as a grapevine. It is repeated a lot in the New Testament. John chapter 15, for example, where Jesus talks about being the true vine, but it's all based on Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah says, I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. This is Isaiah talking about Israel. My loved one, that is God, <clears throat> had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones, planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it, cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes. Now, all of the things here highlighted in red are sort of the things that you would do if you wanted this vine to grow and you expected it to grow and you were uh, coming at it from a very positive perspective, right? So God says, I did everything for Israel and, and, and gave her every encouragement to respond well and to give good fruit. But of course, it yielded only bad fruit, right? So what's going to happen? Well, here's what will happen. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done than I've done for it? I looked for good grapes. Why did it yield only bad? I tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I'll take away its hedge. It'll be destroyed. I will break down its wall and it will be trampled. Now the metaphor is so close here that when you start talking about breaking down the wall, right, the, the, the everyone understands this means exile and siege and being overrun by our enemies. And in fact, that's where the first 39 chapters go. They, they're kind of trending toward exile. Because of your sin, you will be taken away in 722 and in 586, and this is not going to end well. All right. So uh, we're now introduced, the last part of this introduction, to Isaiah. And Isaiah, in his own little microcosmic way, is kind of a preview of the entire book, because he comes to, has this vision of God, and comes to God in this very famous passage, Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on the throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And these seraphim, or seraphs, plural, in the NIV, have six wings, and they're hovering around God. And of course, their biggest impression, what they're overwhelmed with, is God's holiness. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the only right response to that, if you are human, is to say what Isaiah says, woe to me, I am ruined, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, right? Now when he says that, he's not just saying, you know, sometimes in the basketball court I cuss a little bit. What he's, what he's trying to say is what Jesus said, it's not what goes into a person that defiles them, it's what comes out. And what Jesus was talking about was our words express what's in our heart, right? So when he says I'm a man of unclean lips, he also really means I'm a man of a, of a dirty heart, right? My, my motivations from the inside out are evil and need to be cleansed. And so then symbolically, the angel does come, puts this coal on his lips to, not to burn him, but to cleanse him. And he says, your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. So right here in Isaiah's little example, he, he gets or exemplifies for us what should happen to Israel. Israel should repent and have their sins atoned for. So the very first thing that Isaiah does is very, very simple. Isaiah trusts. He says, God, I need help. Would you help me? God says, absolutely, yes. And then very quickly here, uh, as soon as this happens, God says, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah said, here am I, send me. Again, as the example of how to respond, very simple, but Isaiah is willing to tell. Now, I've really, really simplified the book here just to, you know, probably a lot of you, it's the very first introduction to it. So it's pretty simple. It'll get more complex as you move through the study of the book, but this is not a bad way to describe it. Number one, he trusts. And number two, he's ready to tell. And this is the mission statement that God has for Israel. I want you to simply trust me as a son trusts his father, and I want you to tell the rest of the world about me. Right? You want you to be the channel for the good news of God going to the world. And so Isaiah does it well. He trusts and he tells, how will Israel do? Well, let's take a look at the two stories. Right? As you see here, the very first part of the historical center, trust in Yahweh, the basis of mission. I think that may be a little bit different in your notes. Uh, just trying to clean that 
statement up and make it easier for you. Um, the basis of mission is to trust. This is what Isaiah does, and we'll see how Ahaz does with it, all right? So here is the basic historical situation. Now, I'm going to give you um, a, a lot of names here, or some funny names, some new names. And I know that you, when you get, ready to, you get ready to study for the final exam, you're always wondering how much detail do I have to know. And typically, you don't have to know this much detail, but you do this time. So a little hint here, <clears throat> write it down. This is going to be on the test. I want you to know these names, just because if you don't know the names, you're not going to understand the story. So the names are these. Ahaz is king of Judah. Reason is the name of uh, the king of Aram, or Syria, same thing. And Pekah is the king of the northern ten tribes, Israel. Right? Now, just all you have to know is first names. You don't have to know last names or middle names. The king of Israel, his middle name was Boo. That's his friends called him that, but you don't have to. Never mind, never mind. You don't have to know that. Right. So, Ahaz, king of the south. Pekah, king of the ten tribes of the north. And Reason is the king of Syria. Now, that's important because here's the background. The background looks like this. Assyria, the big 500-pound gorilla, is right here where the name is on the map. Syria is right about here where the word Syria is. King, its king is reason, of course. And Israel is right there where the I and the S and the R, at least, are. Uh, and the king is Pekah. Now, what's happening is that Assyria is on the march. And so both Syria and Israel go out to meet that threat because if they have any chance at all, they've got to, they've got to get all these people who normally wouldn't be allies together to fight against this one common enemy. So as they're preparing to do this, Judah is sitting down here in the south, and King Ahaz is sitting there feeling pretty good because he's thinking, okay, I know a series on the move, but, you know, at least I've got these two other buffers in between. Well, Assyria is such a powerful place, powerful country, that uh, Syria and Israel really don't have all, all, all that much of a chance by themselves. So they call on Ahaz and they say, Ahaz, we need you to come help us do this. And Ahaz says, mm, I don't think so. I, I'm not sure I really need to get my hands dirty. And so uh, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, except that it does that Syria and Israel decide, okay, we're coming after you. Now, you, you look at the map, and you look at the situation, and you say, well, that leaves them kind of defenseless. They turned their backs on the big offensive bully, and they did. That doesn't make any sense. Well, no, but it makes sense from this standpoint. How many times have you seen one, someone who was doomed, but they say, look, we may be going down, but guess what? We're taking you with us. And so Syria and Israel come against Judah, and they say, look, if you're not going to help us, we're coming after you. And so they do, and Judah is in a, a hot spot now, right? So that's the background to this story, Ahaz's crisis. So the house of David uh, was told Aram, or Syria, has allied itself with Ephraim, or Israel. So the hearts of Ahaz, king of Judah, and his people were shaken as the trees of the forest are shaken by the wind. And they should be, right? Because they can't take the northern ten tribes and Syria. This is a big, big problem. So the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out, you and your son, to mate Ahaz at the end of the aqueduct of the upper pool on the road to the washerman's field, otherwise known as the Gahan Spring. You say, what in the world is that? Well, let me show you, right? As you're looking down on top of, this, of Jerusalem, right, the city of David, you see the, the central valley to the left and the Kidron Valley to the right. And the walls of the city actually are like here outlined in yellow. And those walls on the edge of the slopes provide a, a pretty formidable and good defense, right? Because as you're trying to come as an, uh, an invading army, come along the side trying to go up the hill and then the walls there, it's just almost impossible, right? So this is a really good place for a city and its walls. But there is one small problem. The only water source that Israel has is the Gahan Spring. And notice a small problem of where it is. Right? It's not like uh, Assyria or Syria and in, in any, any invading army can come and sit around you. Uh, and, and, and the people of Israel, the people of Jerusalem say, uh, could we have a little time out here? Uh, we'd like to come out and get some water, and then we'll go right back in. Right? It's not going to work. 
So we don't know if they actually built another wall around it or they dug down to it and out to get to it. But the point is that whatever the situation is, the king has to come out and make sure this thing is camouflaged, that it's all working right, and so that Israel has water for this siege. At this teachable moment here at the Gahan Spring, Isaiah speaks to Ahaz and says to him, take care and be calm. Have no fear and do not be faint-hearted because of these two stubs of smoldering firebrands, right? Speaking very condescendingly of reason and Pekah, right? On account of the fierce anger of reason and Aram and the son of Remaliah or Pekah. Because they planned evil against you, saying, let us go up against Judah and terrorize it and make for ourselves a breach against walls. So, Isaiah comes along and says, look, God is promising to protect you. So at this point then, Ahaz has a crisis and he has a choice. I can trust God to protect us or I can make another choice. And guess what he does? He chooses poorly and here's what he does. Judah, or Ahaz, decides I'm going to call somebody for help who has skin on him. And so he, he calls out, to Tiglath-Pileser III, otherwise known king of Assyria, known to his friends as TP3, right? And Tiglath-Pileser, he says, hey, uh, I need help. I got a problem. In fact, uh, I've got two problems, uh, Syria and Israel. W would you come help me take care of those two problems? And Tiglath-Pileser says, sure, what are friends for? I'll be right down. And as soon as he comes down, here's what the map looks like. This is the spot in 732 and 722 where the northern ten tribes are carried away into captivity, never to be heard of again, sort of, yeah. And, and, a, and a lot of it, I mean, you can, you can blame them because of their sin, but the immediate cause is Ahaz saying, hey, come help me out, right? And so they carried the northern ten tribes away. Well, this is a really, really stupid choice for Ahaz to make. Number one, he's now under tribute. He has to pay heavy taxes to Assyria, worship their gods. They're still alive, but just barely. And of course, the northern ten tribes are gone. So what happens then is this. This is the lecture, in some sense, that Ahaz gets. And uh, the answer, God is to be trusted. That was a pretty stupid thing to do. So 13 to 35 is, here's what you should have done. You should have trusted. Um, in the words of Isaiah, in the care of God. But you didn't, you didn't. And so uh, let me just tell you why this is such a stupid idea. <clears throat> and what you have from 13 to 35, it, it, uh, you have a, um, it, it's just, well, there's a lot of judgment going on here. Let me just say it that way. There's judgment for Israel, but there's also judgment for uh, Assyria and Babylon and all the other nations. And so what he's basically saying is, do you really want to put your trust in other nations Here's how they will come to an end. It's almost like saying, um, you know, you, you, you don't know how to study well for the test, so your friend says, hey, look, uh, I know how to study, and so you, you study with them. And then you realize, oh, your friend failed the first test, so maybe not such a wise choice, right? Assyria uh, and Babylon are going to fail. They're going to be judged by God. You, you want to throw your lot in with them. This is a really stupid choice, Ahaz. And so... Uh, I'm not going to cover all those chapters, we don't have time, but I'll just get to the summary of it in chapter 34. And in chapter 34, he says, here's where the nations will end up eventually. Come near you nations and listen, pay attention you peoples, let the earth hear and all that's in it. The Lord is angry with all nations, his wrath is upon all their armies, he will totally destroy them, he will give them over to slaughter at some point in time. But then watch, watch these words. Their slain will be thrown out, their dead bodies will stand up a cinch, mountains will be soaked with their blood, the heavens will be dissolved, the sky rolled up like a scroll, and the starry host will fall like withered leaves from the vine. Now, if you didn't know this was from the book of Isaiah, what book in the Bible would you guess it came from? Probably Revelation, right? And again, there's that, there's that close connection between Isaiah, right, talking about Armageddon, and John talking about Armageddon as well. And this is the ultimate spot where the nations will end up, the nations that turn away from Yahweh. So uh, obviously a pretty bad choice unless you want to end up like them. But then there's this contrastive side, verse chapter 35. If you, Ahaz, had trusted in Yahweh, here's where you'd end up. 
And it's this beautiful picture, not of a desert, but of a garden. And here is the statement of what life will be like eventually for those who trust in him. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it'll burst into bloom. It'll rejoice greatly and shout for joy, right? So it's talking about when the curse is reversed. Things that look like this will then look like this. And things that look like this will look like this, right? The desert will be turned into a garden. The, the, the vast wilderness will be turned into a garden of Eden. Where would you rather be? And then you've got these beautiful statements in Isaiah 35 about the eyes of the blind will be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Now, does that ring a bell to you in, from reading the New Testament? Anybody recognize that passage just from the New Testament alone? Because it's there in some really critical places. Yeah, Noah? Well, Jesus does quote it, in fact. And he quotes it when John the Baptist is in prison and things aren't turning out the way John the Baptist thought they would. So he says, hmm, never expected to be in prison, expected the kingdom to come immediately. So John sends his disciples to Jesus and says, uh, are you really the one? And Jesus doesn't say yes or no. He just says, well, here, here's what Isaiah says. I want you to know the eyes of the blind are open, the ears of the deaf are unstopped. The lame are leaping like a deer, right? So Jesus comes as the one to fulfill all this, but of course it doesn't happen. I mean, the miracles are kind of like a preview of the kingdom, but when Israel says, no, we don't want it, then it's postponed for another day. But anyway, that's the, uh, that's the, the beautiful part of where one ends up with trust in him. Or this statement, uh, not from Isaiah 35, but Isaiah chapter 11, beautiful poetry, uh, that is real. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. Verse 7, the cow will feed with the bear. And verse 8, the infant will play near the hole of the cobra and the young child will put his hand into the viper's nest. Now, it's kind of creepy just to think about, it, isn't it? But what it's saying is that when the kingdom comes, nothing on earth will hurt at all. The earth will totally support human life. So if mom and dad want to go out you know, for an evening, and they say, man, we don't have anybody to watch the kids, you can say, well, the snakes can watch the kids. They'll be fine, right? So it, it, it works out. So we always like to have lion and lamb uh, pictures. Uh, it actually says the wolf and the lamb, but, but anyway, it gets the point made. I can't tell you what happens after the picture was taken, but, you know, we're, we're not in the kingdom quite yet. So second half, let's get to this part <clears throat> and talk about Hezekiah for a second. Hezekiah and his failure in chapters 36 to 39. Now, there are actually two stories about Hezekiah here, and I, I want to talk about both of them briefly. So chapter 36, it starts like this. In the 14th year of King Hezekiah's reign, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, different king of Assyria, but still same nation, attacked all the fortified cities of Judah and captured them because Hezekiah had the gall to say, look, we're not paying taxes to you. And, and, and we're not worshiping your gods anymore, which was a smart thing of Hezekiah, for Hezekiah to do. But of course, it brings the wrath of Assyria down, and Sennacherib comes and does some pretty bad things. When the commander stopped at the aqueduct of the upper pool on the road to the washerman's field, and you say, oh, wait a minute, we've seen that before. Yes, you have, right? Very same place here, because the writer's trying to get us to see these two incidents together. We're again under an Assyrian crisis. What will Hezekiah do? Will he do what his dad did or will he do something different? And as it turns out, here's what it looks like in 701, several years later, Sennacherib comes down, takes 46 cities and one big one, Jerusalem, to go. And that's exactly where we are now. So when King Hezekiah heard this, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, went into the temple of the Lord, sent Eliakim, the palace administrator, Shebna the secretary and leading priests all wearing sackcloth to the prophet Isaiah. Notice the difference here. Different response than Ahaz? Absolutely, right? With the first one, Isaiah had to go to him. Now Hezekiah says, hey, we need Isaiah's help, and they go to Isaiah. And make a long story short, skip all the way down to verse 20. Hezekiah's prayer is this, O Lord our God, deliver us from his hands so that all the kingdoms on earth may know that you alone O Lord, our God. Again, really different 
response here. So we have also a different result, which is this. I, I like the way the King James says it. Then the angel of the Lord went forth and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred and fourscore and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses, right? When they, when they got up, they looked at each other and said, man, you look awful. Or maybe it was when the Jerusalemites got up, they looked out and the Assyrians were all gone. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went and returned and dwelt at Nineveh, right? So the king says, hey, this is no fun. My army's all gone. Pfft, I'm getting out of here. And, and he takes off. So it's a resounding victory, but even bigger than you think, because look how this whole story ends. It says this in verse 38. One day, while he was worshiping in the temple of his god Nisroch, this is Sennacherib, the king, the general, his sons Adramelech and Sherezer cut him down with a sword, and they escaped into the land of Ararat, and Esarhad and his sons succeeded him as king. Now, that might look, it's just a, look like a minor historical footnote to you, but I want you to know this is a major theological exclamation point, and here's why. Everyone knows the theology is that uh, every god lives in his temple, right? And, and the, but the power of the god kind of emanates from the temple, uh, physically, locally, like, like a cell tower, right? Like you get close to the tower and it's really strong, the farther away you get, the weaker the God is. So the, the, the way Sennacherib would have spun this in, in, the, in the, his PR uh, was this. Look, our God is really, really powerful. And, and uh, when we got all the way down there to Jerusalem, their tiny little weak God um, in his very own little home court was a little stronger than we were right at the very edges of our power. But the truth is, our God is far stronger, and that's why we couldn't take Jerusalem. Our God is far stronger, and so God says, mm, no, we're, we're not, we're not going to have that. So I'll take the army here in Jerusalem, but I'm going to wait till Sennacherib gets all the way back in his temple, and that is where I will finish the job and take his life. And again, in, in ancient Near Eastern theologies, the God at least will avenge you, right? And so here... The people who kill him don't get avenged. They get away scot-free. And so as you look at this, this is, again, is not a historical footnote. This is the exclamation point that this is a total, absolute, incredible victory. So what Ahaz does here is obviously good and right, and he does not fail where his father does. He succeeds. Trouble is, it's not the only story. There's another story in 38 and 39, and it goes like this. <clears throat> In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. Again, I like the King James here. Isaiah the prophet came and said to him, Thus saith the Lord, set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. It's like, oh no, oh no. I mean, it's bad enough to die, but he's not going to live to, oh man, this is really bad. Yeah, you're going to die and not live too. Okay, all right, well, I guess you're serious about it. So um, he cries out to God and says, Oh God, I don't want to die, I don't want to die. Please don't let me die. And the bottom line here is that um, Isaiah comes back and says, okay, this is what the Lord, the God of your father, David says, I've heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will add 15 years to your life. Now, this is a really complex story because you realize later that part of what happens in these extra 15 years of life he gets is he has Manasseh, who turns out to be the longest reigning and most wicked king that Judah has. You kind of wonder if he shouldn't have just said, okay, Lord, your will be done. But anyway, he cries out and God does give it to him. And, and in this story, here's what the result is. Um, this is the Lord's sign to you that the Lord will do what he has promised. I will make the shadow cast by the sun go back the 10 steps. It has gone down on the stairway of Ahaz. So the sunlight went back the 10 steps that had gone down. Now I, I picture it something like this. There's this shadow coming down the steps. And uh, it's pretty unusual for the shadows to go one way and then reverse themselves, right? It only happens once in history. And so this, this does happen. And we don't know if this was a localized miracle or if, if everyone saw this or not. But this guy who, you know, says he's on his deathbed, imagine he's diagnosed stage four cancer of everything he has or whatever. He's going to die. And then all of a sudden the next day, boom, he's good. He's good to go. He's up and around. So... What happens is people hear about this. And chapter 39 explains. 
At that time, the king of Babylon sent Hezekiah letters and a gift because he'd heard of his illness and recovery. Hezekiah received the envoys gladly and showed them what was in his storehouses. Now watch the list here. Uh, he showed them what was in his storehouses, the silver, the gold, the spices, the fine oil, his entire armory, and everything found among his treasures. There was nothing in his palace or in all his kingdom that Hezekiah did not show them. Now you've got to ask yourself, what, what is he doing here? Right? Which is exactly what Isaiah was wondering. The prophet asked him, what did they see in your palace? <gasps> oh, they saw everything in my palace, Hezekiah said. There's nothing among my treasures I did not show them. Isaiah says, okay, all the things that are really valuable to you, you told them about, right? Yes. So what's most, real, most valuable to you? Right. Hezekiah says, well, I told them all about my gold. And, and Isaiah says, yes, but the most valuable thing you have is God, right? You told them about that, right? He says, I forgot that one. And Isaiah says to him, why do you think God raised you up? Why do you think God gave you this miracle? What, what in the world do you think he put you in the middle of the crossroads of the ancient world for? But for witnessing opportunities like this, this was the perfect time to explain to the king of Babylon who Yahweh is. And you completely failed. Second Chronicles says it like this. When the envoys were sent by the rulers of Babylon to ask him about the miraculous sign that occurred in the land, God left him to test and to know everything that was in his heart. But Hezekiah's heart was proud, and he gave no return to the kindness shown to him. It, it, it the perfect platform for witness, and he completely neglects it. So these two measures of mission, the first is, shall we trust God? Let's take a look at how Ahaz did. He kind of failed completely. When it comes to trusting God, Hezekiah didn't do too badly. He, he trusted God in that first story. But the second measure, shall we tell about God? Ahaz didn't get a chance to answer it, and Hezekiah completely failed in it. Right? So, to get back to the big picture here then, here's kind of the lecture. You know what? Here's what you should have done. You should have given glory to God so that maybe the Babylonians could have come to know him and been saved. And then maybe in a few hundred years, they wouldn't come destroy everything you have. Instead, they're going to write it down. Hey, there's a lot of gold there. Maybe we should get it someday. So <clears throat> the next part of the book, the glory of God, that is bringing glory to God, letting people know where salvation is. And this section here looks <clears throat> forward to the good times after the exile. <clears throat> and it describes, it begins with this. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Now all three gospel writers explain to us who that is. It's not Jesus, you know who it is? This is John the baptizer, right? He's the one, he, in fact, he describes himself that way. Who, who are you? Are you Elijah? Nope, I'm just the guy, I'm just a voice crying in the wilderness. Get ready because the Lord is coming. And so when it says every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill be made low, verse 5, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, it is in Jesus. He is the Lord who is coming to make things right. And so what, what you see here is uh, there will be a servant who tells about who God is. And all through this section, uh, I will not give my glory to another, uh, Isaiah 44. God displays his glory in Israel. I will not yield my glory to another. God is trying to use Israel to demonstrate to the nations, to the Gentiles, where salvation is found. And all the way through chapter 66. Now, let, let me just come back and, um, and, and be specific about this. God will be glorified after the exile by these three things. First of all, the restoration of the nation. And in 40 to 66, we're going to find out here that God still has big plans to bring Israel back to the land, returning from exile, but mostly returning turning to God. So he still has plans for Israel. Number two, there's a lot about the ingathering of the Gentiles. God is going to, after the exile is over, in his time, bring the entire world to himself, right? Because he's been doing that ever since Babel. Right? When, when Babel was divided up into different nations, God said, I'm going to choose this man, Abraham, and he's going to have a nation. And through that nation, all the Gentiles are going to come. And then finally, number three, <clears throat> salvation 
by the servant who will make it all happen. So in these 26 chapters or 27 chapters, an awful lot about a future for Israel, an awful lot about Gentiles coming, and probably the biggest focus is salvation by the servant who will make it all happen. So let me, let me talk about that. I want to talk about what we call the servant songs. The servant songs are these, among others. Chapters 42 and 49 and 50 and 52 to 53. <clears throat> and what they turn out to be are descriptions of the Messiah, who is the ultimate servant who trusts and tells. So you can see here what's going on is Israel fails to trust and to tell. Isaiah does pretty well himself. <clears throat> but ultimately, God's plan is going to be to save the world and Israel through this one who embodies what Israel was supposed to be but was not. And if you want a really sweet study in Messiah, take each one of those chapters and you will find the section where there are poems about him. <clears throat> I just want to go to one of them, Isaiah 52, and break it down a little bit. In Isaiah 52, and you have this text in the notes, it begins like this, see, my servant will act wisely. So here is the one, here is the servant who will be wise. He'll be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. And, and there is a, a huge ironic sense here because in one sense, he is lifted up where people see him. But as again, the Gospel of John says in John chapter 3, He'll be lifted up also on the cross in humiliation and yet exaltation because as they kill him, this is, this is where he ends up saving the world. So he'll be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. And that's why verse 14 comes along and says, just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man and his form <clears throat> beyond human likeness. So it's talking about the physical destruction that happens to Jesus in the Passion Week and particularly in, in the cross. And if you've ever seen movies about it, or there was one a couple years ago by Mel Gibson called The Passion of the Christ, it was really kind of astounding at the time just because of the graphic nature of the crucifixion and the beatings and the whippings. And people were kind of aghast and everyone who left the movie theaters was like, oh, I, I can't believe that. And the only thing that the producer got wrong was they didn't go far enough. Because it says, if you'd seen him, he was disfigured beyond that of a man. <clears throat> you would look at him and say, is, it, is that person still human? In, in as he does that, he will sprinkle many nations, not just Israel, with his blood. And then it goes back to what it was like in his childhood. He grew up before him, that is, Jesus grew up before the Father, like a tender shoot, like a root out of a dry ground, where, where you wouldn't expect him, right? You don't expect to see grass grow in the desert. And that's exactly where Jesus grew up, in Galilee, which is a spiritual desert. And this is why Nathaniel gets introduced to him, and he says to uh, Philip, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And yet Jesus grew up before the Father in Nazareth. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. And uh, if you ever see pictures of Jesus, they're typically a you know, good-looking man or Jewish man or sturdy guy. But the truth is, if we actually showed a picture of what Jesus looked like, none of us would be attracted to him. We'd say, wow, he's pretty average. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. It's a really beautiful poetry here. When I think of this, I think of, I think of me standing in my sin, all beat up and bloodied in a biblical picture, and then Jesus standing next to me. And so every time the whip comes down on him and puts a stripe on him or tears his flesh, it heals mine, right? By his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us turned to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he didn't open his mouth. Again, perfectly fulfilled in the trials. When, when Pilate said to him and when Herod said to him, what do you have to say to these things? And Jesus was quiet. Jesus didn't respond often. 
Why not? Because if Jesus had opened his mouth, he could have gotten off. And he didn't want to get off. He wanted to go to the cross, and so he didn't open his mouth or defend himself. And as a sheep before her shears is silent, he did not open his mouth. So he was assigned a grave with the wicked um, in the potter's field, but he ended up in the rich, that is, with Joseph of Arimathea in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, even though they accused him of blasphemy. So this amazing prophecy about Messiah, the ultimate servant, who suffers and who trusts and who tells the truth, uh, is right there as the answer to what Ahaz and Hezekiah failed at. So, when you take a look at the mission statement to trust and tell, you can see uh, the various people and the various success they had or didn't have. And the question is, what success will I have? Because one day, that is the only standard by which you'll be judged. Every one of us here will stand before God, and his, his questions will simply be, did you trust and did you tell? Did you trust and did you tell? Nothing else really matters but that. 